I believe, or funny that in Amsterdam. But uh, no, it's great to have him along here. He's of course just spent a month in the West Indies. He's got a real tough gig with radio station 3AW and of course with Fox Sports. Please mate, welcome Mr. David Hooks. Hooksy with his Adelaide Crows tie on. Oh, look, I must say, I do feel an imposter here, Jim. I mean, I'm so pleased to be at a club that's been so good to win one flag this decade. Oh, is that right, is it? Now, that, was a, that was a good opening line, wasn't it? I was just about to say, um, for those that didn't know, Chris McDermott on the screen, he was standing with Cornsy. Uh, that was Cornsy on his right. <laughs> Tough gig, this coaching, isn't it? Uh, can I say quite sincerely, um, and I do feel quite honoured to be here, I'm just replacing Jared Healy actually who has to do Talking Footy and I told Jared tonight that there are more people here than will be watching Talking Footy. But <laughs> Not true David. <laughs> but uh, I feel an imposter because I am replacing a footballer in a, 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 such a strong football environment but uh, from Stephen Kernahan's point of view and I can't tell stories about Greg except Jared did tell me to pass on to you Greg that Greg's the only man that because he forgets people's Christian names, he only calls them by their surname. And we heard tonight, Busy. But apparently, Jerry said his favourite one was Oakley. He could never remember Ross's first name, so it was always, G'day, Oakley. Uh, um, but, Sticks, there are many, many stories about Stephen Kernahan that, that can and can't be told. But from a cricket point of view, Stephen and his silly mates from Glenelg used to always come, Jim, to the Sheffield Shield matches at the Adelaide Oval on a Sunday after training or after a night at Lenny's Tavern down at Glenelg. And they were standing there in front of the bar, in front of the school board. And as the day went on and wore on, of course, they got louder and more aggressive. And I think perhaps the funniest thing that Stephen ever said was, there was one day there when South Australia, we were playing uh, New South Wales, and Dirk Wellham uh, was the world, well, John Inverarity was 42 years of age in his last year. A little bit like Brattles will be probably in about four or five years' time. Uh, and Brattles, I, I must say, I played state cricket with Craig. But he is getting old, Jim, because yesterday he ran out at the Optus Oval with a long sleeve Guernsey on before he changed it for the sleeveless one. He's just, when you've got to run out to keep your bones warm, you are struggling, uh, Brattle, so I think it's time to have a good look at yourself. But Johnny Verratti, who was the world's most boring left arm bowler, was bowling to Dirk Willem. And I could replace the word bowler for Dirk with batsman and person. But. And Johnny Verratti, at 42 years of age, bowled four maiden overs in a row. And all we heard from the, from the school board bar was Coonahan yelling out, Hey, Ian Verratti, I've seen younger bowlers on Jack Eye. <laughs> but they would always come into the rooms after the game. They'd always want to go out. But I can tell one story, Jim. And uh, it goes back to Carlton. It's a Carlton story. And in 1984, we, we heard that Stephen came over here in 1985. And Carlton had chased him since he was 15. And they took him on a trip to the United States of America in Las Vegas. And there may be many of your Carlton teammates, Sticks, who perhaps don't know the extent of this story, so it may well have been diluted, Jenny. But we're about to bring it out in its uh, oh, full glory, Jim. Ripper. And that is that he came back and he had his chest puffed out to McDermott and McGuinness and all his mates there, Tony Hall, that he was, you know, he's been wooed by the most famous club in the land, the, the, the Mighty Blues had wooed me, taking me to... United States. Well, apparently the bloke down at Abbotsford says they're the most famous club, but I don't think one flag in 42 years deems you the most famous club in the country. Hey, 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 hey. Well, that's all right. Most successful Not club. Not you, I'm talking about Eddie. And oh, them. Oh, them, down at Abbotsford. Yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> Bloody hell. So, Stephen came back and said, I've met this lady who is the new Miss USA. She'll be perhaps the Miss Universe. Her name is Joy, and uh, I'm bringing you back to Adelaide. Stephen, how are we going? How are we going so far, Sticks? She's a spot on, Hooksy. You. <laughs> so anyway, that was so well Sticks, before you, Jen, though, as you know. Well, I was well before Jen. That's why we can tell the story. So Sticks had bullshitted all his mates at the bay about how good this Sheila was, and she's a Miss USA. So they all went down to the airport, the Adelaide airport, to meet her, and off she came. Now, my mail is that Stephen, when he met her, must have had his beer goggles on because she came off the plane with bright purple hair and Stephen couldn't get rid of her. She would go to the breakfast table while Stephen was having breakfast with his mum and dad and she'd rub his back and say, hi Stephen, how are you going? And 
and so concerned with sticks about her that he in he actually brought mates in to stay with him so that he could talk to them and wouldn't have to talk to her so the story is that joy came from the united states following the carlton trip jim and she was relentless but Stephen found the, uh, the the way and sent her home. She had and to he, a few uh, kilos. She put on a few kilos. Scene, <laughs> but she got off the plane. But is it true, Stephen, that you took McGuinness and McDermott with her to the airport to ensure that she got on the plane? It was a hard one, Hooksy, because um, not that everyone needs to know this, but seeing you brought it up, that she was meant to come for about a week, and I thought it was fair enough getting sort of letters and all that from this girl in America, and as you said, I was a little bit exaggerated to the boys that I'd got onto this nice looking American over there and she writes me letters, have a read of that, you know. <laughs> um, little did I know she's going to roll up six months later on our doorstep and um, she actually had no money and she's meant to stay a week and like she went around to Perth and Sydney and she kept coming back to our place and mum had a soft spot for her and felt sorry <laughs> for her, mum was a lovely lady and we couldn't get rid of her for three months, she'd come back for two weeks, go away for a week and come back for two months and um, <laughs> When uh, she finally had to go, I had to take the airport, I grabbed Bone McDermott. I said, Bone, you coming with me? And he said, no, nah, I can't. I said, Bone, you coming? So I grabbed him, we were taking him to the airport. Mum made me take him to the airport, because <laughs> we'd fallen out well before this, of course, and um, it was a very ugly farewell, as McDermott couldn't resist, and sort of letting her know, please don't ever come back in <laughs> unsavory terms. It was a bit ugly at the airport, but it was a sad, sad <laughs> few months of my life. Was it one way ticket, wasn't mate, from Adelaide Airport? Or what God, was the, we hope yeah. so. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for that, Hooksy. Uh, well, I, should, I should, help, should help Jenny out here because uh, on the night before his wedding, they had the rehearsal and McDermott may utter the... I'm sure he's never uttered these words before. McDermott said to Stephen and, his, and Stephen's two brothers were in the party, as was Chris McDermott, and, and Chris uttered the words, I won't drink, I'll take you to the rehearsal and make sure everything gets done under the right manner. So Chris drove him to the rehearsal. It was a stinking hot January day, and they went to rehearsal, came back, said, look, we better have some fish and chips. It's about 6.30 at night, wedding's tomorrow, and we better go to the Broadway Hotel and have a beer, just one beer. So one beer, of course, turned into a round into three rounds, into five rounds. And later that night, uh, Harry turned up because uh, the old man had been sent around to, to grab his son, who's about to get married tomorrow, and the rest of the wedding party to take them home. They arrived home absolutely paralytic at three o'clock in the morning, the morning of the wedding. And one of those stinking hot Adelaide January days that, that they decided to sleep outside, and they sleeping bags and things, and sticks was on the bottom, and Chris McDermott on top. Uh, no, no, on top of... The, so to uh, so on top of the, uh, the infrastructure and at five in the morning Chris McDermott decided to vomit all over the groom. So Stephen Kernan woke up on the morning of his wedding covered in all Chris McDermott's vomit and well it's been half an hour since they ate and but I was, I was told Stephen that McDermott said that's just payback because two years prior to that you did the thing in reverse. His hooks, it's your show at the moment, mate. Um, You're glad I turned up, are you? I'm only things. just getting over this with my wife, Jenny, at the moment. You just brought back <laughs> some horrible ghosts and memories. But I was actually all right. It was David, Gary and Harry Kearney who were polaxed. I was actually OK. <laughs> but I did reciprocate to McDermott. Yeah. Well batted, Sticks. Very straight bat, mate. Driving down Cavill Avenue in Brisbane the wrong way, down a one-way street. Jeez, who wrote your speech, McDermott and McGuinness, obviously. Oh. <laughs> Oh, those are famous Adelaide stories, Stephen. I think anything you do before you're 20, you can be forgiven in your 30s. <laughs> so was it one way down Cavill Avenue on the Gold Coast, or wasn't it No, one? I wasn't there. That oh, was right a up. fallacy. That, that was Harry again. Oh, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Hooksy, you're on a roll here, mate. No, oh, no, no, I'm finished. Is that <laughs> it? Oh, for a while? Is that it for a while? No, I'll give the bloke a spell. Right. It's his <laughs> night. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank uh, David Hooks for his... Uh, <laughs> ..couple of stories. David's going to stick with us on stage for the uh, remainder. He's going to... So when uh, Sticks is on a roll, David will just sink in there with the right hook, yeah. Um, thanks, Hooksy. And of course, uh, as Hooksy just mentioned, um, of course, Jenny is in the crowd tonight, and we've mentioned uh, the mood like in Adelaide when, obviously, Kernahan, Bradley, Motley. I mean, what was, what was the feeling back there when you lost three of your favourite football sons? Well, I, I think from a South Australian perspective, we lost three blokes from three different sides. I think that was always going to be hurtful for the local competition. Sticks from Glenelg, Bradles from Port Adelaide, and Peter Motley from Sturt. And I think that... 
yes, they were going to one club, but I think from South Australia's point of view that the three players were going, and it really was the start of the exodus of outstanding players coming to Victoria to play in what was then the, the elite competition. There was a players concert at Glenelg that year, and the players got up and sang a tune to Six to, six to Ask Him to Stay. Uh, and uh, there was a tear in Stephen's eye when he realised that uh, all his mates had wanted him to stay at Glenelg. But I think that even in those days, the, the local competition, that the clubs individually did appreciate that champion players had to go and had to test themselves in the best competition. And I think Wayne Carey the same. Wayne Carey never played a, a league game in Adelaide, but his club at North Adelaide said, look, you've got to go, you've got to test yourself. And look, it was a, a terrifically sad day for South Australia. And uh, I think we all were disappointed that our three champion players had gone at once, uh, all champion state players as well, state of origin players. And uh, I think that we all felt the tragedy of Peter Motley in Adelaide equally as they did here with Carlton and, and Victoria. But nobody in Adelaide begrudges the success that Stephen and Craig have had. And indeed, your Johnny Platton's and your Tony Halls and all the others that went around about the same time. And I think that everybody in South Australia appreciates that they have taken to Victoria a bit of South Australia, but they've done very well and they've, they've held, their held, held their heads high. Held their heads high. Held their heads high and yeah. have always been proud of South Australians as well. And I think uh, you touched on, well, Greg touched on being captain of Victoria. I think nobody. Uh, has been a, a more proud South Australian than Stephen Kernahan or Craig Bradley with the uh, South Australian colours on.